continuing our studies on the heart, which is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. You know, I heard a fellow say just this week, he said, well, you know, if you just follow your heart, and I'm like, well, <laughs> and he's like, why do you, why do you get so nervous? I'm like, well, <laughs> it depends on the condition of your heart when you're following it. Uh, as to whether or not it's the right thing. Real quickly, I was asked to repeat this, and so I'm just going to go over it in a cursory manner, then you can get it uh, from the uh, tape. Let's uh, pray. Father, thank you for your many blessings, and thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for these folks that are here. I pray you'll bless us uh, with your presence today, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I talked uh, on Sunday night about repentance and about the importance of it. And uh, I told you just a couple of things if you're wanting to write this down, but I'll put it on the whatever the thing is that they um, put on the, uh, what is it, MP3, I guess is what it's called, so that you can get it off of that if you would like to. By the way, Trista, congratulations on finishing your Christian studies. Well done. She graduated, so... All right, for, uh, number one, true repentance does three things, and it'll have some subpoints. Number one, causes great contrition. Uh, that's deeply affected with grief and sorrow for offending God. That should change the way you think, should change the way you act as far as your will is concerned, and it will definitely have an effect on your emotions. He says a, uh, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Uh, one of the things that people try to get you out of nowadays is this thought or this idea that feeling guilty is bad. No, feeling guilty is good. Uh, when you feel bad about doing bad, that's the right thing. You never want to get to a point that you get so case hardened that when you do bad, you don't feel bad. You want your kids to feel bad when they do wrong. Amen. You say, no, no, that's their own governor so that when they're not around you, then they feel bad about doing something that they shouldn't have done. And so that's the thing. It affects your emotions, all right? It causes a confession. If you want to get right over it, that's why 1 John 1, 7 to 9 is in there. Uh, unconfessed sin will affect you spiritually. It'll affect you psychologically. And it'll also affect you physically. In other words, if you keep retaining that stuff after a period of time, it has an emotional effect on you, but it also has a physical effect on you. And then number three... It should, as a result of that, cause a change in your conduct, meaning that I'm striving not to continue to repeat the things I did that got me in the trouble, right? Now, that's what some people call besetting sins, and some people say to you that when you do that stuff, what they say to you is, well, that's just human nature. Well, that's just how man is. Well, you just know, no, 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 wait a minute. You have a new nature now. So I hear this on a regular basis. Well, people don't change. Well, people may not change, but the Lord tells you to put off the old man with all the things that go with the old man and put on the new man. That requires an effort. That requires some things that you have to learn how to do. Being the new man doesn't by nature just occur. That's why when you're dead in trespasses and sin, when you get saved, you begin to notice changes in people that are in subjection to the will of God. So it's not just a matter of my relationship with the Lord is just I repented and got right. It's like, no, I have to utilize that. Excuse me. I have to utilize that to be able to continue to grow in my relationship with the Lord, recognizing that speed bump along the way, that wait a minute vine that grabbed me, that thorn that stuck me. Those are indicators, those are things that I'm not where I need to be, but I don't have to keep repeating the same behavior. Does that make sense to you? You should learn from your mistakes so that the mistakes don't become repetitive. Now, I hate to, to say this to you, but it's a true statement. Uh, too many people get this idea that correctional institutions actually correct behaviors. They actually don't correct behaviors. Correctional institutions were originally there to punish wrong behaviors. They weren't there to be corrective. Your recidivism rate is still sky high. You say, why? They got every program you can possibly imagine to try to change human nature. Listen, unless you're saved, but if you don't activate that salvation by then putting on the new man, there's no difference in you and an unsaved person except the eternal destination. You are completely capable of doing anything you could do before you got saved 
except go to hell. If you're capable of doing one thing, you're capable of doing anything. Anything. The only thing you can't do is you can't go to hell. Now, if you'll recognize that about yourself, it'll help you to keep yourself in check. You don't need a preacher that has to keep you in check or a, a prison system or a straitjacket to keep you in check. You know what you have to learn to do? You have to learn God put those things in you to try to help you along the way, not to hurt you. Uh, people pick up the Bible and they read the Bible and all they see is, well, it's just a list of do's and don'ts. Well, what Bible are you reading? <laughs> I mean, there's a whole lot more in the Bible than just stop this, stop that, and start this and start that. I mean, there's all kind of great stuff that's in the Bible if you take the time to read more than that. But if you go in with this, I'm looking to be offended attitude right off the bat, guess what's going to happen? Look, I had to change my attitude about going into Walmart. Now, I know that's, that is somewhat humorous because I made a lot of jokes about going to Walmart, you know, and people are in Walmart and it's like they must have stayed there all night long because they're still in their pajamas and their slippers and they're texting and driving inside Walmart and the guy that's at the front door, you know, I, I went out the other day, Walmart, and I'm walking out the door and I'm handing the guy my receipt. He goes, I'm a greeter. I was like, oh, I said, well, I thought you were here at the door. He goes, no, same door in, same door out. I said, Okay, well, I just want you to know I'm not a, you know, shoplifting. I, saw. <laughs> I thought it was like, you know, at Costco's, they check your thing and then, you know, put the deal on there like they really check it, right? But at any rate, they, they, they check. So I thought that's what the guy, I'm a greeter. And I'm thinking, well, okay, and this is why I have a bad attitude when I come into Walmart. But then the Lord tests me because what I recognized was is that every time I pulled in, I already had a mindset Something bad's going to happen because it's Walmart, right? And it didn't happen every time I went there, but I was looking for it to happen every time I went there. If you go to your Bible and your mind is made up that every time you read it, something bad's going to happen, guess what you're going to find? Something bad is going to happen. <laughs> Every story you read is going to be with you at the hind end of that thing, and then you're going to wind up getting stabbed and stuck all that. Well, every time I read the Bible, it's just I'm doing wrong all the time. Well, what are you looking for? Are you looking for God's blessings? Are you looking for His mercy? Are you looking for His long-suffering? Are you looking for His love? Or are you just looking for Him to pound you? He must have a guilty conscience. So you have to learn to change some of the ways that you think about certain things. Now I'm going to give you this stuff in the book of Proverbs, and we're going to run through this relatively quickly this morning. I'll hope to try to get it through to you uh, in maybe the next 30 minutes or so. Look, if you will, please. We'll pick it up in Proverbs chapter number 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Talking about the heart and talking about understanding that when we're talking about the heart, we're talking about between your ears. I just heard a preacher preaching the other day and he was talking about if uh, all that the Word of God does is go into your head and it misses your heart by 18 inches, you wind up going to hell. Well, I know what he's saying, but you understand the difference in that now, right? You understand the analogy is, is the heart becomes the seat of everything that causes you to run. The, the ego, I guess you would say if you're using a psychological term, but I wouldn't cross the Bible and Freud or, or uh, Young for anything whatsoever. Amen. You, you, don't want, you don't want to fool with that. Right. There's some science to it. But you know what? When you pare that thing down, when you pull out just the backbone of where all that stuff began, you know what you find out? It's based on biblical principles. Can you believe that? Amen. There are certain things the Lord knows is wrong with you psychologically and you need some help. And so He deals with it through your heart. Yes. Yes. That's the thing you've got to grab a hold of. All right, let's look at the, the thing that the heart does. Look in uh, chapter number 2. And come down, if you will, please, to verse number 9. Thou shalt, not, thou shalt, then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. The soul's there in the heart, right? Notice what he says. Where does wisdom dwell? It dwells in your heart. See, it's connected with emotions. Do you ever get a, a sense of... Um, um, I, don't, I hate to call it, it's like a sixth sense, but you ever get a sense that something's not right? And you have enough wisdom to know better than to do something. You don't maybe know exactly what it is, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. Your senses are telling you something's not right. You dealt with that this morning, something's not right, right? 
Okay, what is that? That's wisdom. You know how to act on it. Acting on that, that little sense is, listen, your kids come up and somebody's doing something odd or strange or unusual. It's a stranger. They don't know, don't know anything about them, don't know anything about where they're from. And that kid gets this sign of an icky, something's not right feeling. Wisdom is acting on that something's not right feeling. I always recommend the little ones, if that happens, just scream. I mean, scream bloody murder. You, you say, well, but what if they're wrong? Who cares? The, the older person should have known better. Right? You know, I, I, well, anyway, I think, I hope you understand that, if you would, please. Look in uh, chapter number three. Come down, if you will, please, in verse number four. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine and lean not to thine own understanding. So it's not just the seed of wisdom. It's also the seed of trust. You can't trust the Lord with your intellect. You have to trust Him by faith in your heart. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own what? All right, there's a comparison of your heart following the Lord by faith and your intellect. I'm not saying not to enhance your intellect. Can I say this as charitably as possible? Don't be ignorant all your life. Read. Study. Uh, give attention to reading. Read a wide variety of things. Vociferously go through that information and devour that information. The more of that information that you get in you, the more beneficial you will be to yourself and to other people. I'm not just talking about getting your own point of view about something. I mean, read that and make the comparisons and the contrasts along the way. I'm not a book burner. I'm not somebody that believes in taking you and saying you can only read this stack of material. I believe you should read this stack of material and that should be the flashlight that shows you the fallacies and all the other material. But how else are you going to explain to a kid about life if when that kid is faced with life, they've never been exposed to it. You've only given them one side of the coin. Okay, well fine. Well then when they see a dissenting opinion, then you know what you're able to do? You're able to take that dissenting opinion and go, here's why that's wrong. Right. People ask me all the time, all the time. I get this all the time. Well, they're going to public school. They're being taught evolution. So? So what? What does that mean? Well, I mean, so then they come home and you can say, well, here's why it isn't right. <laughs> God created heaven. This is what the Bible says. Well, but, 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 but that they're teaching in school. Do you think the kid's going to fall for that? Not if you balance it. Moses went to a public school. He came out okay. I know I'm going to get sideways with you right here. I understand that. I know that the idea is that, you know, if we homeschool all of our kids and everything's going to be right. Well, how's that working out for you? You've been homeschooling for years now. You've been homeschooling now for 27 years, 28 years, 29 years, right along in there. You know what? You're not seeing a difference in your homeschool kids as you are to public school or private school or Christian school. There are not less of them getting pregnant. There's not less of them being put in jail. There's not less of them being, or more of them being faithful in church. The answer is not just homeschooling. I'm for homeschooling. Don't under, but, but there is nothing more detrimental to a child than for somebody that is not called to teach to try to teach a child and then run them out in the world and expect them to get a job and not know what in the cat ear they're doing. Amen. I think it's good. Mom teaches homeschool, good. And then dad comes in and said, let's go to work. You say, what is that? A practical application of what you're learning at home. Yeah. That's the right balance. Yeah. That ain't how it works in the real world. Come on out here and, and get around that. Well, daddy, this guy's he's cussing and swearing. Good, you know not to do that. Right? Daddy, this guy's looking at stuff. Y'all, Good, you know not to do that. You say, what is that? That's helping him to all of a sudden not get drawn to it because it's the first time he's ever been around it. Mom and dad are there to balance that. Now, don't get up and leave between the church service now because you see you, you get gothardized and get this idea, well, if I just do this, my kids are going to turn out. No, that doesn't mean anything. And some of them you put at a deficit because then they wind up going out here and they can't get a job. They don't know anything. They've got no skills and they got no social skills. Hi, how are you? Are you the devil? You must be the devil. Amen. Why? Why? Because. Uh, no, look, I, I, listen, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand education without salvation is damnation. I get that. 
But you got to also realize the world in which you live, you have to educate people so that they're able to make a cotton pick and live in. So you know what you do? You, we got people in here from all walks of life. You got people in here that have been successful in military and people that have been successful as policemen, people that have been successful as plumbers, people that have been successful as landscapers, people that have been successful. Well, where did they learn that? They learned the proper education. Don't ever get the idea that when you're looking at train up a child in the way he should go out of the book of Proverbs, that that's Solomon talking to his son and he's giving him instruction. It's the same one that told his son, if you'll listen to me and if you'll do what I tell you to do and if you'll do that. He doesn't put it there as a promise. He said, this is what you ought to be doing. I've known a lot of them trained up right. Some of them that I know personally are sitting in jail cells right now, and they were trained right. And some of them have been married multitude of times. There's no guarantee you say, why? You're dealing with human nature. You're dealing with a wicked heart. That's why. Now, maybe that's a little bit too much of what I did for years and years and years, but I've seen the other side of that. I've seen both sides of that coin, maybe more so than some of you, not bragging. I'm just simply saying to you, you can't get this mindset that if I just do this, this is absolute. No. The only thing absolute is, is that if I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, I'm going to heaven. Right. Beyond that, you can't guarantee how your kid's going to come out. You train them up, you do the best you possibly can, and you teach them to fear God, and you teach them to get a relationship with God, and then when they get put in those compromising situations, they know how to make the right decisions. Amen. But there's no guarantee any more than there was when you were coming up. I find the ones that are hardest on that were the ones that are most difficult as kids themselves. But they forgot when they were kids. And now they're in the church, and they love the Lord, and they believe the book, and they don't want you to, well, you messed up. I'm not for kids messing up. I'm not for it at all. I'll be a bastion of help for them if they want to come back to the house and try to get things right. But I'm not so stupid as to believe that the people that push that to heart has always lived pure as a driven snow and lived at the foot of the cross. You know what he says? That intellect is something you need to learn. You say what? Because some of you, I, I, I'm trying to be careful, but some of you, you're just downright lazy. You spend way too much time in front of video games with cell phones and with television than you do doing any reading whatsoever. All you're doing is, you're, all, you're, you're the people that are always worried about propaganda. Right. You're worried about, you know, they're, they're trying to feed you propaganda. Well, then quit watching it. Amen. It's insanity. I don't, even, I don't even understand that, why you would say that, but then you watch it every day. You know, this is just propaganda. This is just propaganda. This is just propaganda. Well, then why are you continuing to look at it? Amen. Well, I can just tell you why. You're lazy. Yeah. Come on. But you try to talk like you're intellectual because you've consumed a lot of information. But let me ask you a question. I got a garbage pail at the house, and I also have a refrigerator. Which would you rather eat out of? Right. Amen. Which one do you think would be more healthy? Seems kind of stupid, doesn't it, to say that kind of an analogy? Well, why you spend all the time looking at the garbage can? Because it's fair and balanced. They would never lie to me. And then you go to the news sites that tell it the way you want it to be told? <laughs> and then the preacher gets up and he says, Thus saith the Lord. Oh, you know... I'm just not really sure about that. Okay, well these two things, first of all, wisdom, trust comes from the heart. Look in verse number, uh, chapter number four, chapter four. Trust in the Lord, have uh, confidence in the Lord, lean on the Lord, be able to know that His promises are true. You know, the only way you know His promises are true is when you act on them and you see them come through. And then you know what you do over a period of time? You begin to trust them. I have friends I've known for years and years and years and years. You know what I know? I know I can trust them. You say, why? Over a period of time, it gets put a little pressure there, and it continues to come through and continues to come through, and after a while, I don't doubt that I can trust them. All right, verse number 23, chapter 4, verse number 23. Um, that's it. Keep thy what? With for out of it are the issues of life. Isn't that interesting? Look in verse 20. My son, attend to my 
words, incline thine ear to my let, n let them not, the words, depart from thine eyes. Keep them in front of you. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Wow, why? For the words, they, the words, are life unto those that find them and health to their... You know what I know? I know you read that book, it'll give you a facelift. I know it'll help you. So what does he say there to you? He says there to you that uh, the diligence is important for you. You see, where does that come from? Where's that second gear come from? Where's that ability to dig deep and make things happen? The Lord said, keep thy heart with all diligence. I mean, put some effort into it. You know what he's trying to tell you? He's trying to tell you it doesn't happen naturally. You have to watch what goes in your eyes. You have to watch what goes in your ears. You say, why? What goes in your eyes affects your Do you know the verse? What goes in your eyes affects your, how you see things. Well, I, but, I, but I saw it. I saw it. I'm from Missouri. I saw it. I, I won't believe it unless I see it. I saw it. I actually saw that. It, re it really took place. Are you sure? Are you sure it wasn't sleight of hand? Are you sure it wasn't corrupted by the glasses you had on, the filter that you had on? Are you sure that you really saw what was really there? Have you kept your heart with all diligence? It takes effort, doesn't it? My goodness, man, you're out there walking through a septic tank every day, every day. I mean, the stuff nowadays that comes on just to coming across the television set, it's not fit for kids to look at at all. They got every kind of advertisement you can pop. I can't imagine sitting there with a kid with a, a, a bowl of uh, popcorn or whatever, and then some of the commercials coming up there that they're advertising for different kinds of contraceptives and different kinds of, of uh, problems that have to do with marriage and different things like that. I'm talking about how do you, what do you, what do you do when a kid says, what's that? Yeah. Um, you know what? <laughs> Let's play a game. Let's play Monopoly or something. Or, or whatever game you want to play. I know what you do. Let's play a game. <laughs> and then you wonder why your kid's dressed in a long black coat and going to a school. Taking out targets. So what are they? They're in training. Literally, they're in training. You're desensitizing them. And you know what they think? It's just a game. Literally, it's just a game. I can go get what I want physically from a kid, from a 14 or 13-year-old girl, and then I can stab her over 100 times and then go home. Mama help me wash my jeans out and take a shower, and, and uh, it's just a game. You so, say, preacher, come on. No, just south of here, just a little bit. So what was it? A kid in high school. Did you see the news on that? Did you see some of the stuff that that joker said? You said, well, he's laughing. <laughs> Y'all seen her right over here, little girl under a waterbed for a week. Maddie, that's back in my day. What did he do? Killed her, hit her under the waterbed. Came out looking for her like he was part of it. So what is that? Desensitized. Let me just say this to you, and Sam's not in here, but Tara is. Uh, don't send your kids to camp if you don't want them to hear that. Because I'm going to be preaching camp, and I'm going to tell them, you ain't going to grow in the Lord, you're going to grow in something else. And I don't care if you do condone video games for your kids, I'm preaching against it. Amen. Well, it's my kid, not to, no, it's not, it's not your kid, and it ain't the video game. That's your new babysitter. Chapter 6. This is a good one. Look at verse number 13. Well, I'll make it 12. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. That's a deceitful mouth. That's uh, uh, being deceptive in the way that he talks. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet where he goes. He teaches with his fingers. Frowardness is in his... He deviseth mischief continually, he soweth discord. You say, what's his problem out of the abundance of the heart? What's the fraudness? Deceptions in his heart. It's not that, he's, it, it's not that he uh, doesn't know what he's doing. 
He knows exactly what he's doing. When you deal with an individual like this, ladies and gentlemen, you keep a cool head and a warm heart and you don't get all jacked up about it, but you're dealing with somebody whose heart's bad. And so what you do is, is you recognize they know exactly what they're doing. So how do you handle it? See you later. Right. Not gonna argue with somebody like that. You say, why? They're all gonna be about preserving themselves. Frowardness winds up being in the heart, a, a perverseness that winds up being there. Look in verse number 18, same chapter. Oh, this is the six things the Lord hates, seven are abomination to him. Look at verse number 18. A heart that deviseth wicked what? Imaginations and feet that be swift and running to mischief. Now there's a multitude of ways to be able to do that. You say what? You can make people believe something by telling an untruth. You can spin things in such a way with just enough of the truth in it that you can't really nail down, well, you lied. The most dangerous truth there is, is 90% true. I mean, the most dangerous lie there is, is 90% true. You can paint it out to be a certain way. You say, where's the problem with a liar? The problem's in their heart. The problem's not what comes out of their mouth. The problem's in their heart. Come down a little bit further is the same thing. Look at verse number 25. Lust not after her beauty in thine, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. You say, well, the preacher, does that mean a woman shouldn't wear eyeshadow and all that? Oh, cut it out. You surely, surely are not that stupid. You know what that is? That's a woman talking to you with her eyes. You know how that is. My mama used to talk to me with her eyes, and it had nothing to do with the passage here. <laughs> My mama would be sitting up in the choir, and I'd hear, <coughs> And all three of us would immediately look up <laughs> like a horse that's eating grass. And all of a sudden you look up, and look, oh, somebody's in trouble. <laughs> and man, she would be locked in. And unfortunately, sometimes it was me. <laughs> and buddy, she'd give you the eye. Boy, I mean. Amen. Amen. And you knew she's talking to you with her eyes. Well, that's what he's talking about. You say, what happens? It affects you where she really likes me. She really thinks I'm all that in a bag of chips. Boy, she thinks I'm the cat's meow. Man, you got to watch for that. You say, why? It don't just happen nowadays, ladies, with uh, women. Men know how to do that. Come on down the same passage. It's interesting all this stuff's in there. Uh, verse number 25 deals with lust and where it is. Look in chapter number 7. Look in verse number 10. Uh, in the twilight, verse number nine, in the black and the dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with an attire of an harlot and a what? Subtle heart. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the devil, Satan, was the most subtle beast of any beast of the field. Trickery, sharp, easy to talk, con man. You know what happens? You get to study in your Bible. The Bible says Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, and he was a very subtle man. Trickery. Always there to provide something for you. He listened to what Amnon had to say about Tamar and how I just, I, 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 that's his sister, man. Mm -hmm. I just got to have her, man. She's just purity and all that kind of stuff. And she's pure. You knew that because she wore the robes, the garment of a, of a virgin. And boy, I'm just telling you what, I'm, I'm just sick over. I got to have her. I got to have her. And Jonadab fix it up and connives an entire plan and says, I'll tell you what we can do, man. Let me... Let me work this out for you, uh, 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 Jonadab. Let me tell you how it is. I mean, uh, Jonadab says to Amnon, he said, let me tell you how we'll do this. You act like you're sick and I'll call your sister. And when she gets over here to the house, I'll have her make you some food, some chicken noodle soup and stuff like that. And I'll have her, when she gets it ready, I'll make sure that the guards are on the outside there and I'll make sure she slips in. And when she comes in, you go ahead and close the door and latch it behind you. <laughs> And then you let her know you ain't really sick, but you're in love with her and we'll take care of the plan. How's that sound to you? And Amnon says, well, it sounds like a good plan to me. And you know the rest of the story. You see, you think there's only do's and don'ts in the Bible. You know the rest of the story. That old girl comes in there. She's just, uh, just innocent and doesn't know about certain things. And who would expect your brother to do such foolishness? And, you know, that's the king's son. Right? 
And so she comes in there, hey, I'm sorry you're sick. And he's got a thermometer in there and got an ice pack on his head, you know, and he's laid there and acting like he's shivering and trembling underneath the blankets. And she goes in and makes chicken soup or whatever it is that she's making there. And when she gets done with all that stuff, you know what she does? She comes in there and he steps out of that bed and he locks the door and she says, now wait, now stop. Don't do this. This is bad. You need to quit. But he already had it in his heart to do it. And Jonadab's out there encouraging him, do it. And then after he's defiled her and he's finished with what he wants, he's like, get out of here. And she said, now wait, let two wrongs don't make a right. Let's go to daddy the king and let's get things fixed up here, okay? And uh, just don't put me away. What you've done is bad enough. But don't put me away. Get out, get out, get out. You say, what happened? A subtle man, always trying to do something. I call him a con man. Mm -hmm. Always trying to do something on the sly. You know, easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Right. You mean you're intending to do wrong. Right. How do you know you're intended to do wrong? Easier to ask for forgiveness? You already know you're doing Why would you have to ask for forgiveness? If it was right, why wouldn't you go and ask, what, what, hey, is it all right if I do this? Why, no, I, I'll ask for forgiveness for not asking because, you know, <laughs> what you don't know doesn't hurt you. But it's already done now. Well, it's done. That girl winds up uh, sitting out and being all alone the rest of her life. All because of the lust of a young man and a very subtle friend. You know what the old preacher used to say? The old preacher said, I read a book about this thick. And he said, it was written by, I couldn't remember the name to save my neck. And he said, but you know what I learned out of reading that book? And he said, you learn a lot of things by reading books. You know, you need to learn to read and that kind of a thing. But he said, you know what I learned reading that book? He said, what he said at the end of that thing was, is the only person that you can con, if you're a con, is another con. Amen. I thought, man, that's profound. How come you're so easily tricked by subtle people trying to figure out a way for you to get what you want? Why do you want to do that? Subtle. Why don't you just be straight? This wasn't intended to put you under uh, uh, um, conviction. <laughs> Chapter 8. But when you deal with the heart... Look, if you will, please, uh, in verse number 5. This will have to do with your understanding. Verse 4, Unto you, O men, I call my voice as to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. You know what happens? Come down to verse 9. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and write to them that find knowledge. You see what happens, an individual comes in and talk, you gather the knowledge, and then what happens? You get wisdom from that knowledge, and then wisdom as to how do you apply that knowledge, but understanding it is how does it relate to God. You know what he just said? Have an understanding heart. You need to consider, how's this going to affect my relationship with the Lord? How's God see what I'm about to do? Amen. How's the Lord look at it? Does it really matter? Those are the kinds of things that are important for you. Look in chapter 12. We're not going to make it through all of these. I didn't mean to give you quite as much commentary, but it'll be all right. Chapter 12. Uh, come, if you will, please, verse number 17. That's the one where the fool's uh, uh, ways are right in his own heart there. Verse 17, he speaketh truth, showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is a speaketh like piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors peace is joy. Now what he just said there to you is, is that that kind of uh, knowledge doesn't come from above. He just said deceit's in your heart. Look at you will please in... Uh, Come to James. It'll be one or three there. Let me. I'm trying to get it to come up from the bottom of the pool. There it is. James chapter number three, verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, 
glory not and lie not against the truth. For this wisdom, bittering, bitter envy and strife, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now what he just said to you there is if what he gave you here in the book of Proverbs is true, you know what he just said? He said it comes from the wrong source. You say sources matter? Absolutely they matter. Do you want a surgeon working on your heart? If you look at your heart with the four ventricles that are in the heart and the way the chambers are laid out and all that other kind of stuff that goes along with that and the pericardium surrounding it and that kind of a deal, the aorta coming into it and the widowmaker coming in the back of it and all that kind of stuff. When you take a look at that, it's really like a plumbing pump. Really, it's just like, it's like a plumbing pump. That's, that's all it is. <laughs> Ask Brother Robert, he'll tell you. It's like a pump. That's, that's what it's like. It's what it's called. It pumps all the time, right? It's a muscle and it works like that. You want a plumber doing heart, heart surgery on you? Well, it's just a pump. You say, well, does the source matter uh, when it comes to who's going to operate on me? Now, at the same time, I don't care if a heart surgeon knows how to crack my chest and fix that pump in here. I don't want him at my house when my septic tank's backed up. Amen. You say, why? He's used to working in a sterile environment. You ever look at what plumbers work in? You need somebody that's not afraid to get dirty. Do you see it? The source matters. It makes a difference. It matters what you read. It matters what you look at. It matters what you hear. It matters what you say what? The source matters. The book that you have in front of you is pure. Let me just give you one or two more here and we'll go ahead and close down for the, for the morning time here. Look at, um, come back to the book of Proverbs now if you're already there. And uh, look at uh, chapter 12, um, verse number 23. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. Look in verse 24 and 25. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop. Means to bow down, means to lean over, means to be heavy hearted. It's pulling you down. Uh, but a good word maketh it glad. You'll notice sometimes when people are under pressure, they talk about the burden being on them. That's the heart pulling them down. That heart's heavy in there in the sense of geographically locating it here. But imagine this. Your head weighs about 14 to 18 pounds. Depends on if you're water-headed or not, big-headed or whatever you want to call it. But an average is about 14 pounds. You know what happens as you start getting older? You know what happens? You get this thing called forward head posture. When that head leads this way over a period of time, that's 14 pounds pulling on a regular basis. You're pulling your traps. You're pulling your trapezius muscles. You're pulling your rhomboids. You're pulling all the stuff down through the litter back. Your lats are getting pulled into the middle. Those, mess, those are meant to stay up and back. They're supposed to be short. When you elongate them, you know what you do? You shorten these. So guess what happens? Over time, the head comes, and after a while, you see people with rounded out shoulders. The shoulders turn down this way. I'm not recommending the chiropractor to you or nothing. I'm just trying to make an illustration. And then what happens if the head's down? You know what you're doing? You see people that are looking up this way all the time. You say, why? Wow, that head's pulling them down all the time. That's called stress. That's called strain. That's called worry. That's called concern. That's this heavy all the time. Then before long, you'll see a physical manifestation to it. That's why you see older people, you'll see that. That, that, that head will get out this way and it gradually it begins to pull them down this way. And then these muscles get elongated. And these scalenes and all that stuff here, they wind up getting shorter. And they're supposed to be longer to keep your head up and back. And then before long, you're this way. And you pooched out here a little bit. You say, well, be surprised how much slimmer you look if you just stand up and back. Right. And people say, oh, my aching back. No, what pulled your back over was 14 pounds of pressure every day walking this way. Well, after a while, you know what happens? <laughs> you succumb to the pressure. You know what he says? That heaviness, that depression, you know what it'll do? 
It bows you down. The Bible knows exactly what it's saying to you. It winds up getting you into that position. But I want you to notice that besides that being bowed down, you know what else he says? It says that folly comes out of that. Look in, look in verse number 23. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. You ever been around somebody, every time they open their mouth, you're thinking, what an idiot. What a fool. You ever been around people that they, they play too much, they joke too much? Everything's a joke. Everything's a joke. Everything's a joke. Some jokes ain't funny. The Bible talks in there about foolish jesting. And you know what sometimes people do? I was taught something years ago. I guess it's true. I don't know for a fact whether or not it is. But I guess it's probably true. You know what they say? There's an element of truth in, uh, in every joke. When somebody, when, you know, well, well, think about this. Why is it that you're so fresh that you, you, you make fun of people? Even if, if they're your friend? I guess maybe y'all never been made fun of. <laughs> I grew up skinny and redheaded. I mean redheaded. You say, well, what's the big deal? You made jokes about redheaded people, fair-skinned people. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not blaming you for that. I'm simply saying I know what it's like to have people make fun of you. Yep. Amen. Oh, but here's the thing. Do I make fun of people? Sometimes you have different ways of making fun of them. Foolish jesting. You know what it says? That folly, where does that come from? That's what you're thinking. That's called a diversionary tactic. It keeps the light off of you and always puts it on somebody else. It puts people at ed on edge. You don't know how to have a proper conversation with people. You've got to do something to change the subject. Some kind of joke. You ever been around somebody where you're having a real serious conversation and it's, and it's serious, man? I mean, like sometimes almost to the point of tears. And then all of a sudden they're like, you know, <laughs> look at the waiter, man. <laughs> I mean, look, and you're like, where'd that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. You're getting too close to the cotton. Amen, amen. What is that? Folly. Folly. That's just unthought of, unprovoked, just diarrhea of the mouth. Just whatever comes to your head, you say it. No filter is what they call it. Just shoot your mouth off. Oh, I was just kidding. <laughs> it ain't funny. Amen. You know, oh, well, you know, you can't take a joke. Don't put it on me. You shouldn't have said it. Don't turn around and put it on me. I know what it's like to be in the barrel. I know what it's like to be in front of roll call and all, I, I get all that. Well, you got to bless God, get a thicker skin. Well, how about, okay, fine, I'll get a thicker skin, but how about if you shut your mouth? Amen. Wouldn't that be nice? Amen. I mean, why do you want to make it, oh, you need to get a thicker skin? Why don't you need to shut up? There's more in the Bible on you shutting up than me getting a thicker skin. Amen. Well, you know, they're, they're so thin skinned you can blow them, uh, smoke through them, you know. Oh, okay, that may be true, but you got to say things that are constantly offending people. I mean, is it possible that maybe you're the problem? But you always put it off on, well, they just need to get a thicker skin. Well, okay, I might agree with you if it comes to things in the Bible. Sword cuts pretty deep, doesn't it? Sure, yeah. But some of the things we've gotten accustomed to, I'm just going to hit this real quick and then we're going to stop. But some of the things, because you're so involved in uh, television programs and all the stuff that you're seeing on social media, you think everybody's free and fair game now. All they do is constantly exploit and blow up the lives of people that are out there from the Queen of England's grandson or great-grandson, whichever one he is, and his marital life and all that other kind of stuff, to some Zorro guy or some guy that swung off of ships and was, uh, uh, he was a bird. Hang on a minute, it's coming to me. Jack Sparrow. Uh, uh, do you know there were more people that watched that and watched hearings in court? They watch that every day like they're watching a soap opera. His ex-wife suing him for them getting into fisticuffs at the house. Millions of dollars. Well, from the looks of some of your faces, you must have been tuned in every day <laughs> to somebody's private, personal life. And did it move the needle in your life at all? Oh, he won the case. I can still go to his movies. You, 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 you're, 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 mm, boy. <laughs> you know what that does? That makes you think that all the brethren in here, that their lives are your personal business. 
No, the Bible calls you a talebearer, a gossiper, and a slander. Yeah. If friends let you into that portion of their life, that's between you and your friends. But it doesn't give you automatic access. They used to have this thing years ago. I um, shot them. Anyway, they used to have this thing years ago. We used to have to work all these concerts and wrestling matches and all this stuff we had to work. Back then it was the Coliseum and then it was Alltel or I can't remember what they changed the name of the big dome to and all that. But at any rate. They had these things and people had different levels of passes and different uh, uh, colors of the passes and all that. And they had to wear it around. This is before lanyards even became, you know, the big deal. They'd have them around there. Some of them have, you know, from all the concerts they've been to. And they had a pass called All Access. That meant you couldn't keep them from going anywhere they wanted to go as far as the concert stuff and all that was concerned. Well, that's how some of you are toward other people. You think because they're your friend or because they're in your family or because they're part of your church that you have an all access pass to their life. That's not biblical. Nope. Amen. You know what the hardest thing to do? Stay in your own lane, run your own race and stay out of everybody's business and be careful about somebody that's always trying to pull you into their business. Amen. Father bless your word this morning and pray you'll be with us in the upcoming hour in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.